Okay, so I'm on schedule, I think, uh, to give a talk about connectivity, which I'm not sure means what that means, but it covers a lot of ground, so maybe uh, I will cover it. Um, I'm actually going to start by saying that my name is Tali Wheatley, and as Luke pointed out, I am a social psychologist. Oh, hang on, sorry, this isn't playing. Oh, I know, don't mess with it. Come on, come back. Yeah, okay. All right, I'm a social psychologist, which uh, you might think is about as far away from cognitive neuroscience as you can get in the space of still studying human nature, right? Social psychology uh, looks like this, cognitive neuroscience looks like that. But they're actually remarkably similar in that their approach is identical. And that is to say their approach is about studying the average person. Okay, so social psychologists uh, throw away all individual variation, at least traditionally they do, and they look at how does the average person uh, act in a situation when an authority figure is telling them what to do, or how does the average person act in a rural environment versus a big city, and so on. And cognitive neuroscience, uh, as you know, is about how the average person, or how the average brain processes music, or processes words, or integrates words into a longer narrative, or what have you, right? It's the, they're both the science of central tendencies. They're both about the average person. Okay, but as Jim Haxby reminded us, what, like two days ago? There is no canonical brain. There is no actual average person. That aver the average person doesn't exist, right? It's just a figment of probabilistic. Um, and so uh, it's increasingly becoming clear to me that I think as great as our science is, we have been missing a lot. And so um, to frame it a little bit more positively than what we've been missing, this is in Comic Sans, my hopes and dreams for a brighter future in cognitive neuroscience. Um, but really it's about what we've been missing. And I think um, there's a couple things that I, there are a couple things that I want to say about what I think the, the two big bins of things we've been missing. And one is individual variation and how important that is, and the other is brain-to-brain -brain influence. So I want to uh, talk about each and really push these ideas home with a lot of analogies, but also some data. So let me start with individual variation. So this is you know, what makes us fundamentally who we are, right? It makes me, me, and you, you, and you know, the fact that we uh, click more with some people than others, the fact that um, you know, Luke married, where is Luke? Luke somewhere married uh, Eunice and uh, Chris married Janice. And I've been practicing that all morning because I was afraid I was going to get those backwards because they both <laughs> end in the same syllable, which is nice, right? Actually, literally nice. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but as we learned from Chris yesterday, like, the beginnings of words are really important, right? Girl is not hurl, is not furl. Um, so Janice and Eunice are different people. And Luke and Chris uh, made different choices, right? They are not interchangeable. That's pre-coffee, that's the best I can do. Okay. If they were interchangeable, you would see personal ads like this, but we don't. Right? But this is what our, our, this is what our science would suggest we would be looking for, right? If there weren't individual differences that mattered, this wouldn't make us feel like, oh, right? This wouldn't. It, it, there are individual differences and they matter. There's variation that needs to be understood because it makes life as rich as it is. So how do we capture individual variation? Well, I think uh, there's uh, one of the, the best things to come out of personality psychology is this idea of the importance of weak situations. So what is a weak situation and conversely, what is a strong situation? Well, these are strong situations, birthday parties, funerals, lecture halls, they, they massively constrain the kinds of thoughts, feelings, and actions we have, right? And so you, these suppress any sort of rich individual variation, okay? In contrast, a personality psychologist would say the, a park is a weak situation because people do all sorts of things in that big possibility space, right? And actually their true personality emerges in, in contexts like these. You can think of the internet as being a huge possibility space through which to explore your individual variation, right? Your search history 
is fundamentally who you are, as horrifying as that is to all of us. Okay, I have a, a friend of mine, uh, Jamie Pennebaker at the University of Texas, who's a natural language processing guy. His lab will actually give him the content to all their emails, but they won't give him their search history. Because the search history is, that is as personal as it gets, right? This huge possibility space, the internet at our fingertips, and yet uh, that is us sort of traveling through it. And good parents know this. The good parents know that weak toys are better than strong toys. And what I mean by this is blocks are awesome. Blocks can make you know, a road, river, a castle. You can do anything with blocks. right? But you give uh, kids, this is what my parents gave my kids one Christmas, a chicken dance Elmo, <laughs> which sucks as a toy. right? It's just bullshit, because it just does everything. It does the chicken dance, and it's done. right? And there's like, one reaction in the child and a different reaction in the parents, and you're, you're done. It's a strong toy. Toys that are this strong leave no room for actually for children to express who they are, for their minds to do anything at all. Okay. And so if we uh, take this out of the paradigm of sort of parks and parents, and we think about um, our science, the same thing is playing out. So imagine this uh, sort of, uh, last um, analogy, uh, if you will. Imagine your significant other comes home from work and you ask them, how are you feeling? Okay. And you listen to what they have to say and they talk for a while. That's it. Okay. Got that? All right, put that aside. Now imagine your significant other comes home and you ask them how they're feeling, but as they start to speak, you say, ba-ba-ba and you hand them a bunch of Likert scales in which they have to respond, how happy am I on a scale of one to seven? <laughs> Not at all happy, very much happy. How angry am I on a scale of one to seven, right? I mean, which version would actually capture real human rich information and which version do we do, right, <laughs> as scientists? I mean, if you think about our paradigms, they are strong situations with sort of, um, our preconceived notions of how people should respond and we, and we shun people around in this way and we're missing a lot of the rich variation in natural human behavior, rich variation that I think our methods are, well, we know you guys are on the, on the cutting edge of these things, right? You know that we are beginning to have methods that can really handle the richness of natural human behavior, um, natural language and so forth. Okay. All right, and so I want to show you one study that we did that I think moves in this direction of exploiting individual variation and finding something out. Uh, this is work with Carolyn Parkinson, who uh, graduated with a PhD from Dartmouth and went to um, UCLA. She's now an assistant professor there. And Adam Kleinbaum, who's an associate professor here at the Tuck School of Business. And this is our starting point. So conventional wisdom is that we are friends with people of a similar mind. Right, our friends think like us, feel like us, and what we've been calling this, and what the, actually the title of the paper under review right now, is neural homophily. Homophily meaning like goes with like. It's, an, it's a term common in social network analysis. And it's an ancient idea, right? It, it goes back to at least the 15th century, which you should recognize as birds of a feather flock together. And uh, it describes, usually in social network analysis, it describes how people tend to cluster with other people who they look like, who the same age, the same gender, the same demographics, start to dress alike, start to move alike, these sorts of um, clusterings, clumpiness in the social space exist. And this is a picture of uh, me it, in London, and I'm annoyed because my, my husband's taking a picture of me across the street. I just missed the light, and I don't know why he's taking a picture. Um, and then he shows me that I found my tribe, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but does it go beyond sort of looking alike and similar heights and things like that? Are we really friends with people that fundamentally uh, have brains that work similarly to us? Are we friends with people of a similar mind? So the really, one of the great things about living in the middle of nowhere, uh, where there are no people, um, there's lots of natural beauty, but the tree to person ratio is very high, um, is that you can study something like a social network and really get some purchase on it. And, and actually, even better than being 
here in Hanover, in Dartmouth, is to, to be in the Tuck School of Business, because this is a building on campus that is isolated within an isolated place. I mean, they, uh, they study together, they take all their classes together, the same classes together, they eat together, and they live together all in this building and a building that is adjoining by a hallway, right? So they never have to leave this, the confines of this sort of cloistered environment. So, um, and luckily for me, I have a colleague at the School of Business who every year asks every Tuck student, and they are beholden to answer because it's part of their grade, to answer this question. Consider the people with whom you like to spend your free time. Since you arrived at Dartmouth, who are the classmates you've been with most often for informal social activities, such as going out to lunch, dinner, etc. This is basically, like, this is what it means to be a friend. And then they, uh, they get a roster of all the names of the people in their cohort, all 250 something of them, and they start to check off the people that meet this definition of friendship, right? And as long as everybody does that, which they do, you can construct their social network entirely. And you can look and see how it changes. It's pretty stable after about six months. It changes a little bit, but you can, you can grab it. So what we did was we, we got their social network, and we took people out of this social network, the orange circles there, and we took people who are friends with each other. So I'm just going to put names on those two uh, nodes. <clears throat> We can also see, we can also take people who are not directly friends, but who are friends of friends. And we can take people who are friends of friends of friends. They need two intervening people between them. And so we can start to ask the question that the closer you get in, in your social network, the closer the social distance, are people in fact more similar in terms of their patterns of thought? So we had them watch video clips that were previously unseen by participants. They were chosen to be engaging, so to minimize any kind of mind wandering. Um, and importantly for this talk, I wanna highlight that they were chosen specifically to be differentiating, to, in the sense that weak situations uh, allow for variation to be expressed. These were clips where not everybody would respond in exactly the same way at exactly the same time. So I wanna show you um, what these clips look like. These clips were actually much longer in the scanner, but I want to give you a sense of the breadth of, of what we covered. When I was outside on uh, my first spacewalk, I was on the dark side of the world over the Indian Ocean. And by having workers who only had to do one thing, I gave them a low wage, and it was very easy to find someone to replace them. The water squeezes out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it uh, is insulting when a coach is making 5 to 10 to 15 times more than a college president. These babies are not strong enough to cling, and they fall to the ground repeatedly. <laughs> it's at times like that you don't often think of funny things to say, but I did. And I turned to the rescue workers and I said, talk about a rough day at work. <laughs> that was... Uh, <laughs> referring to the spending the time up there being pretty rough. <laughs> Talk about a rough day at work. <laughs> okay. All right. So there was slapstick. There was more sort of mockumentary style uh, humor and politics and science and all sorts of things. Um, so we, we took the brains and we segmented, reconstructed, and uh, parcelated them into 80... Uh, uh, anatomically defined ROIs through three surfer, free surfer. And basically, we just took the average time series out of each of these ROIs and looked at how they correlate across subjects pairwise through the entire, the entire data set. So, um, so just a graphic of that. Out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it okay, all right. So you get the idea. You correlate the corresponding time series. And I'm, this is going to, I've got the paper with me and the supplementary information. If you want uh, to know how your key area uh, responded, I can, I can look it up for you in the massive table that we have. But basically, here is the normalized results um, for each uh, brain region. 
And what we see essentially is a pattern like this, that uh, <clears throat> relative to the mean uh, similarity uh, between pair, within pairs, when people are friends of friends of friends, they are relatively dissimilar in terms of their neural activity while watching these clips. Again, they ha they're not seeing them together, they're seeing them separately, they haven't seen them before, but they're engaging and differentiating. And the differentiating worked in the sense that it allowed for individual variation to be expressed. So you move one uh, social notch in, friends of friends, be, uh, brain areas tend to become overall more, more similar. And friends are remarkably similar relative to uh, friends of friends, and they're more similar um, uh, statistically than friends of friends of friends. So the idea here is that when subjected to a common but differentiating stimulus, friends uh, events more, neural, more similar neural responses than friends of friends, who in turn are more similar than friends of friends of friends. Right now, we're trying to um, get this uh, plan follow-up off the ground in which as soon as the, tuck, the next cohort comes in, we scan them with these movies and see whether or not we can predict before they've met each other which of them will become friends, right? We've done the cross-sectional piece that's under review right now. We want to see where does the causal arrow of this lie. Yes, I just. Yeah. Sure. That's a great. That's a great question, and we didn't. I mean, I don't know a principled way of. <clears throat> All I can say is that the possibility space was sufficiently broad to capture uh, the differences by social distance. But we had, um, we didn't just have that humor clip. We had very, like, really stupid slapstick and, and, and various political clips about various things. We just wanted to capture a broad array of topics that people might differentiate on. But um, whether they differentiated more on this dimension versus that, we don't know. Right. This is sort of an early like proof of concept that you can start to look at this variation. It can be meaningful, and that's about it. Okay. So the main um, result there that I want to convey is that um, once you allow people to vary, you can use something like neural alignment to predict differences in how um, people form uh, these relationships. Okay. So that's my one. Um, uh, study that we've done so far that sort of capitalized on individual variation. Right now, Bo is doing a study looking at personality, how people um, might cluster in terms of the way they tend to process uh, a wide variety of uh, video clips that try to capture differences among personality dimensions, a similar idea. If we give people a sufficiently broad possibility space, can we see the natural sort of clumping and what does it look like? OK. Um, all right, the next uh, thing that I think we're missing, or I wish we would push more into, I hope that's my hope for you guys, is this idea of brain-to-brain -brain influence. Um, we are in a massively social species that really cares about other brains. Right? We are not brains in boxes. We care about other brains around us. I'm going to go through this really quickly, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I just wanted to illustrate. A very simple point is that we care about other brains. This is a study we published this, this year in Nature Human Behavior. This is Carolyn Parkinson again. And we took, the, uh, we took a cohort of Tuck participants. We scanned them while they were, just while they were passively watching um, people in their network. So for whatever reason, Tuck students, when they arrive, have to get in front of a camera, and for two seconds, they have to say, hello, my name is so, such and such, and I am from so and so place. No idea why, but that it's like a video uh, Facebook thing. Um, and uh, so we're having them, we have them lie in the scanner, and they watch a lot of these videos with the sound off. They see these people that they know moving around. Um, and the upshot of this is we found that when people encounter, i.e. see, someone they know, they spontaneously activate all kinds of information about where that person sits in the larger social network that they share. Right? So you can decode from the observer's brain where the person that they're observing sits. 
in the larger social space. And we did that by uh, you know, using a searchlight to um, capture local neural response patterns, um, turn that into a local neural dissimilar so dissimilarity matrix, um, and, uh, and we can see based on like, distances away from each other in social space and also properties that these people um, have in terms of the position of, in their social network, like how central they are, which is how well-connected they are to well-connected others, how much they bridge disparate cliques in a network versus are constrained to certain sort of uh, sectors of the space. And we can start to build, we can build models not only of the neural data, but also of uh, the social network data. We can, we can build a model that captures um, if they're seeing their friend or a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend, that social distance. We can build a model that captures the uh, centrality of the person that they're viewing, how central, the high sort of social status, hubbiness of a person. And we can model something like network constraint or brokerage, how the person that you're watching, whether they sort of bridge disparate cliques in a network, whether they kind of interface with different kinds of groups. And I'm not going to go into this um, very much, just to say that the brain really does seem to care about this information and care about this information in a privileged sense, in the sense that as soon as we see somebody, this comes for free. We can decode in several brain regions um, whether they're a friend, whether they're central, whether they're a broker, and so forth. So presumably, and this is a presumption, but presumably um, the reason why we spend metabolic energy uh, to do this automatically, even in the absence of a task, is that it is important for us, it is, is that it is um, advantageous in a sort of an evolutionary fitness kind of sense. And it's certainly uh, what we do um, in our day-to-day -day lives, right? I mean, this is us, or some of you, right? And you can see that what have you been doing, right? Other than this moment where you're just sort of passively looking at me, that's, that's unusual in our day-to-day -day lives. You will leave here, when you, when you go on break, you'll cluster together and you'll get into hackathons and that is how we think, right? That is how we do science. It sure would be cool if we actually studied how that magic happens. Okay. And so um, we've been sort of uh, dipping our toes into the water of uh, how this magic happens, how brains influence and impinge on each other. Um, and the first study I want to uh, show you um, is a study that actually uses pupillometry, which isn't a brain study per se, but I would, I would argue that pupillometry is a sort of brain imaging on a budget. It's, um, right, and, and it's, it's, uh, it captures all this information that's coming out of our eyes, which is a lot more information than people typically think. And I think we have this intuition that we can, we can be at a party and we can see someone looking at us and we can know whether they're sort of with us. They might be staring at us, but we know they're not really with us in a way. I, the fantastic Mr. Fox captures this, I think, um, in, in the best way I've seen. Right, so we've all seen that uh, in front of us, or at least I have, and, um, and the reason why it's not ridiculous to think that uh, you might get this information, or this might, information might be available um, in the way our, our, our pupils um, dilate is, is this, simply that the locus ceruleus is the source of norepinephrine to the forebrain, and norepinephrine, as we know, causes changes in attention and arousal. So it's not crazy to think of the pupillary response as a kind of a, a brain response, right? The pupil dilations are closely coupled to the locus ceruleus firing, and this close association is essentially an honest, involuntary signal. We can't control it. Um, it's uh, high res, uh, and it's actually really useful for, um, if you have an eye tracker, to be able to see what people are paying attention to and when people are paying attention. I'm not going to go into this study, but we did a study to show, using dichotic listening, to show that these pupil dilations, if you look at them um, with high temporal resolution, you can see what people are consciously attending to based on the patterns of these pupil dilations. 
right? They track the content of conscious attention. But what I will tell you about is a study we just published a couple months ago in which we used this fact to look at when do people tune in to each other? When do brains couple? Um, and the, uh, the question is, do pupil dilation patterns synchronize during shared attention? If pupil dilation patterns reflect what we're attending to, and we're both attending to the same thing, they should logically couple. Right? So to do this, we took speakers who we videotaped and eye tracked as they spoke about eight of their most positive and negative memories. Then we had listeners, a lot of listeners watched the videos while they themselves were eye tracked. And we also gauged uh, their empathy levels with the IRI. So I'm going to show you what this kind of looks like. You're going to see um, a speaker. You're going to see a listener in a chin rest. Um, and you're going to see uh, the listener uh, pupillary uh, dilation time series and the listener uh, pupillary dilation time series. Okay, so that's what the data look like. And the first thing that we noticed, and this was our a prior hypothesis, and the reason why we studied empathy, was that the high empathy listeners tended to couple more. We used dynamic time warping to look at the cost function of two time series, um, how uh, synchronous they were over time. And the high empathy listeners coupled with the speakers more than the low empathy listeners. So what you're looking at here is the black line is the same speaker in both cases. And the purple line uh, is the high empathy listener, and the red line is a low empathy listener. Right. So that was the first result, was that empathy seems to matter how much you tune in and share attention with another person. Um, the other thing that we saw that we weren't thinking of ahead of time, so this is sort of exploratory, is that there were moments, nonetheless, when everybody seemed to tune in, even the low empathy listeners. And so. Um, what we did was we looked for those parts of each of the story. We looked for where the most synchrony between speakers and listeners happened for each story. This is the first kiss story that you heard. And in this story, um, there happened to be the most synchrony towards the end of the story. And it, it's not always in, in different stories at different places. The story is at the end. And so what you can do is you can look for that bump up in synchrony and go, okay, what was happening at that point in the story that caused everybody to tune in, right? And I'm just going to show you a visualization of uh, eight subjects' data for this one story. And what you're going to see is that the pupil dilations of these eight subjects are sort of randomly doing their own thing. And then there's a moment where everybody tunes in. We get to the golf course, and there are stars everywhere. So I'm like, I'm going to lay down and look at the stars. It's like completely amazing. So we lay down together. Okay, so all I wanted him to do was kiss me, and then it was a silent for a few moments. He leaned over and actually did kiss me, and it was just so amazing. <clears throat> so this is just sort of eyeballing this data, obviously, and it's just a visualization. Um, but if you look through each of the stories, you see that it's the most emotionally climactic parts that you get the synchrony. So this is the first kiss story. Here's a friend's suicide. The worst thing is, you know, they could tell that he had changed his mind halfway through, but it was too late. Um, and it sure looks like the emotional uh, climax of these stories, but we did it in a more uh, principled way, of course, and we had 25 independent raters judge the emotional salience of each story with a, with a slider and uh, found that these curves lie right on top of each other. The curve that uh, tells us when people most synchronize between speakers and listeners is the same moment that independent raters rate as the emotionally evocative part of the story. So what I've shown you is that uh, you can use uh, pupillary synchrony, you can use neural synchrony to get at this idea of uh, 
brains influencing each other. And uh, you can look at things like individual differences, like their level of empathy and whether they're friends to see if that individual variation can be expressed. Assuming you don't have too strong of a situation that squashes that variation. But this doesn't yet catch alignment in the act. And that's where we really want to move next. So I'm going to show you a video taken by um, Uri Hassan, who many of you have worked with and who uh, just got to join R01 with to look at um, how brains influence each other in real time. And this is his video uh, that I think nicely demonstrates this idea that we're missing a lot of the story if we're not looking about how minds feed back on each other and interact. And so this is just with metronomes. And so they're set at different points. And Uri is going to put them on these two cylinders to allow them to give each other feedback. We don't think this is a million miles away from what we do in interaction, but we've been missing it because we don't tend to study people in interaction. Um, the, the first study uh, that we're doing in the lab to look at this is with Bo, who's sitting right here. And Bo is running the study currently and gave me permission to share it. I think it's pretty cool. Um, and it's the idea, the idea is does unguided conversation synchronize people's neural representations, their world models? Right? Do, we, do we use interaction with each other to sort of come into alignment, much like those metronomes came into alignment? And here's how we're doing it. So in scanner session one, participants come in and they view ambiguous movies uh, while they're being scanned. The soundtrack is removed to strip contextual cues. They are purposely designed to be weak clips in the personality psychology sense. They're, they're purposely designed to be ambiguous, to allow for individual variation in interpretation. And after they see these clips, they are uh, given a questionnaire about who are the characters in this movie, what are the relationships between the characters, what happened, what's going on, what's the backstory, and so on. Then, once they've done that as individuals, they come together in groups. So each of these people, and actually there's five people in a group, but just showing three, um, when they come together, they've all seen as individuals these clips, and they've all sort of tried to figure out what's going on. Now they have to come to a consensus opinion about what was happening in the clips. OK, so let me just show you a clip so you kind of know what the stimuli look like. OK, so what's their relationship? What's going on? Why did that happen? What was the backstory? You have to figure that out as a group and come to a consensus. And then what we do is we scan these people again. After they've come to a consensus opinion, they see the same clips again. And they also see novel clips that are, come from the same movies of the same characters but are later on in time. So the idea is, can we actually see people's brains, can we measure people's brains coming into alignment due to conversation? And does that alignment uh, predict, you know, those models getting set predict how they interpret new clips going forward? OK. Um, well, before I get to that, here's <laughs> previously viewed movies followed by novel movies. Um, with the same characters at scan session two, and this is the basic idea, right, is you're looking for change in intersubject correlation um, before and after. Do people come into uh, alignment? Right. Okay. So do people look more similar after com bef than before? Do they have more similar interpretations after the conversation task than before? 
Okay, and these are a little bit out of order. So and I'm just going to show you this really, really briefly because it's super preliminary and I shouldn't be showing it to you. So all I'll say is we've scanned nine participants, so a little bit of data, and all we know is it's working. Proof of concept is we can start, we're, we're seeing uh, real results, or what seem like real results in terms of, of being able to track alignment over time, but it's early days. Um, one of the promises of this work is not only can we track uh, alignment as it happens over time, but also who aligns to whom, okay? So under the assumption that not everybody comes to an equal amount of neural alignment to get to a consensus, who has the most sort of gravitational pull in the group? And because we're taking these groups from the talk population, we know what positions they hold in the larger real world social network. So we can ask questions like, does the person who moved uh, other people's brains closer to his or her, her own, do they also uh, have a privileged position in their social network, an influential position in their social network? Who has an outsized sort of gravitational pull on other people, right? And can we, can we see that with this kind of technique? Okay, sorry about that. Oh no. Okay. All right, so what next? So where we're going, but we haven't um, gotten there yet, is to look at these processes in real time. So Bo's study, I think, is cutting edge and super cool, but it's before and after, and we're missing seeing the magic happen in real time. So what we have just started uh, to get to work is hyperscanning with fMRI. We're also currently doing studies, Sophie Wolchen is doing pupillometry, hyperpupillometry, uh, people wearing these uh, glasses while they have conversations to see if people synchronize, and generally taking a dynamical systems view of conversation and communication and uh, looking at shared understanding as an attractor state in a system that emerges from interacting minds and what patterns look like across minds. Um, this is the, uh, the lab right now, and this is sort of where we're going. Um, and this work, I should say, is with Uri Hassan uh, at Princeton, part of this R01 that we have. And if anybody's interested in doing a postdoc, uh, particularly if you have like an applied math or dynamical systems background, because I think the math is going to be really key to working this out, uh, please get in touch. I will warn you, though, that this is like a, this kind of work, this hyperscanning idea, is like a level of hell for a social neuroscientist. Because like, I'm a social psychologist, so I want to know how do real people interact in real rich social situations, right? And what I'm left with doing, if I want to understand the neural basis of that, is sticking people in dark, noisy tubes, lying supine, and two different buildings um, where they can't move. And in fact, not only can they not move, but, but they're wearing Jack Allen's uh, head cases that are these foam custom-made things that just snugly fit over your, your face like a Roman helmet, and you, may, you get super sweaty. And so it's like, it's like if, 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 if the devil could say, okay, you're a social psychologist, and you want to understand how the brain does this Thing called social behavior that's great, here are the constraints, right? It's almost like what's worse, uh, you know, making people hang upside down or something also? I, I don't know, but it's like you can't move, you're lying individually in a noisy tube. That's why I, I'm really hopeful, really genuinely hopeful that you guys will uh, rise to the challenge of creating a better, creating better methods, better machines, better techniques, better tools, so that we can actually get to a really muscular, rich uh, social neuroscience. Godspeed, guys. OK. All right, so in conclusion, um, this is where uh, I hope I've sort of taken you. We spend our lives moving from one interaction to the next, collectively sharing and creating information. That is arguably how we think. This isn't just about social behavior. This is about memory. It's about learning. It's what our brains do, right? This is why isolation is a big risk factor for mental health uh, problems. 
it's why solitary confinement is torture. We think collectively and we spend our lives doing it. We know very little, however, about how we do this, how patterns of thought are instantiated across brains and why it's easier to create those patterns with some people more than others. Both of those things require the things our field is missing. What will we learn from examining real-time, unconstrained, interactive paradigms? Will the results change how we fundamentally think about thinking? We don't know. It's unclear. Right? We don't have the opportunity to know because we don't really do it yet. But what is clear is we spend our lives <laughs> doing it. So ultimately, if we really want to understand human behavior at a deep level, we have to include paradigms that look like the things we do. Right? We need interactive, unconstrained paradigms to understand human thought and behavior because arguably that's what we do all the time and it's how we do this, right? It's how we do what we love. It's how we do science, right? This is us. Why don't we understand how this works, right? We've got to push towards understanding how we actually do the science that we love. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Justin. Yeah, that is, that's one of the hopes. So certainly we have an NRSA in right now um, uh, to look at that very question. That um, We have an opportunity with the Tuck population to know what the ground truth is with how people are connected versus isolated and how that uh, relates to um, how in tune they are uh, to these different stimuli. And the hope is that if we can show that, that you know, uh, the stimuli in the lab and how people connect with other people in the lab actually does um, connect to what really happens in a social network and, and where they are in terms of how connected they are. Then we can, uh, then in, um, in real clinical situations where a clinician has no idea whether this person is isolated in their social network or not, they can use these tools and make inferences about that they are likely to be at risk for social isolation because they can't do the things that would predict um, being well connected. Sure. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> yeah. We controlled for uh, those. We controlled for um, centrality, I believe. We also controlled for uh, all kinds of demographics. I guess my, so it does centrality. Um, well, yeah. Imagine the centrality could have its own effect. Yes, for sure. Well, um, extroverts also tend to be uh, highly central and have more friends. Yeah. In the beginning about the, uh, there are no mean individuals. You could imagine that there's a mean individual who lives in the right. middle of the network. Right. And everyone else is just further and further connected. Hmm. And so there's some effect of just being in the milieu of the center, and then people who are in that central milieu are probabilistically more likely to be. Yes. Although this, others. but in the data here, this is all. Um, I don't know if this helps answer your question, but this data is, oh God, something like 50 different people, um, somewhere in the 50s. I'm blanking on exact a number, but it creates 800, sorry, it creates 861 pairs, right? So what's in this data are everybody is um, contributing both uh, 
uh, one node away and two nodes away and three nodes away, right? So there are, uh, and we had to control for the dependencies in those pairwise comparisons. Um, so it's not that, um, does that, does that help answer the question? Yeah. Right. No, but you're right. It could be in there. are going to be less similar. I will say that you go, if you go outside of three degrees away, it's, it's noise. So it doesn't, it doesn't like get, people don't get more and more dissimilar so that everybody in Egypt that you've never met is the most possibly dissimilar to you. That wouldn't make any sense, right? So there are, in fact, um, what I'm not showing here is social distance four and five, which just go back to just, it's just random. It's not predictive. You can, you can train a classifier, and we do have that in the paper, where, where a, a computer can classify um, this pair are likely to be friends. This pair are likely to be friends of friends. Yeah. <coughs> it is absolutely. Um, wait, no, I think it goes the other way, that there are more people that are, um, I can't remember, but you're right, it, they're unequal groups. And so we had to do data folding to control for that. I did I again? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh -huh. How all of these things, this, that stuff, what's happening in five minutes. And uh, given that that ended on our hackathon project, but where we're modeling sort of the matching networks and how we do wall spreads, I'm really wondering whether it's possible to create different, okay, hackathon project, one person, one simulating one person's sort of semantic network and see how this revolves, et cetera, happens there. The papers that we've done, different network sort of structures. Yes. Thinking about combining the two for your individual variable, so people whose semantic maps are similar to each other and different from each other in different structures, which is entirely without people, but it will generate some of the predictions that you. That's really nice. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really nice, and I love and I love your work uh, in particular because it shows how um, how this individual variation can determine the structures of our larger social networks. Right. We're all people, but we're not. But because of our individual variation, we connect in particular different ways. It's like uh, Christakis talks about uh, graphite and diamond having the same molecular structure, but it's in how those nodes are connected that changes everything, right? Yes. Um, I don't know if I can answer that definitively, but I'll, let me just uh, tell you how we, the only way we get the centrality data is by asking people to check off who they're friends with. And then we can construct, just by virtue of that, who are, who are well-connected to well-connected others, um, who are in this sort of these dense pockets of well-connected space. Um, 
that surely maps on to amount of times we see certain people, but I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer the, the differences. All I can say is how we constructed our model. Um, I'm missing, I'm missing something. What am I missing? Like, is it, do you think that they're actually making a computation of like how similar they are, or do you think that they're doing something else that might be offended? Like, well, there are some instances like the Mexican leader that they're talking other times when they're just voting. Well, I think like it's, maybe it's more about the distance idea, like the, like the impairment we're working on. <laughs> I think maybe that's closest to what. Um, so the, so. Yep. And found that there was some part of the parietal cortex that seemed to get confused at these different types. And one of their, not this particular one, but the one of the other papers talked about was looking at distance in the social network. And I think you guys found the same problem. Yeah, we did. Um, kind of, I think it's a different word, but I think that's kind of what you're asking. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking or not. But uh, we, we found um, here, the, 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 we found a region in, uh, IPL, which is uh, what we also found in this other study where um, that region uh, decodes whether uh, something is near and dear to you or uh, far away from you, both in, um, both in time and in, in space and in terms of social distance. Um, but that you know, distance is really sort of easy to think about, right? It's, is this person a friend, a close friend, or a distant acquaintance, we even use those terms, right, to structure the way we think about it. But that's, I don't think that's your question. I think your question is, um, what makes someone central? Uh, yeah, okay, so, Bo? So, so my take on this, I could be, I could be wrong, uh, is that it's possible that eigenvector causality and constraints in this case are both confounded with other traits, for example. So people who are um, uh, extremely nice or extremely convincing, yeah, I would argue it's not a confound. It's just part of the, what it means to be central. Oh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. This is just, all this is a proof of concept of showing that the brain automatically encodes the information. What that information really is, what it really maps onto, we don't, we don't know. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, there's, from, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That would be fabulous. Yes. Right. So why don't we take a uh, thank Tali again?